A very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all. I am Rituparna from Clarnet, a designated session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used digital platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for the doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be a digital partner for this insightful webinar on TURP in a patient with AIHD, organized by the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Now, without wasting any further minute, let's begin today's session for which I would like to invite Dr. Murli Tharar Karchi, sir, to coordinate further. Welcome you, sir. So the dais is all yours. Please proceed. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction. And I'm grateful to the clinic for this opportunity to present the ICA webinar on a regular basis. Uh, I would welcome all the participants, the faculty members and others who are in the meeting for this uh, session. And uh, as you all know, the ICA Wednesday webinars have become the hallmark of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Today's topic is ischemic heart disease and uh, patient undergoing uh, the transurethral resection of the prostate, a very common problem. We will deal with the approach to non-cardiac surgery in cardiac patients followed by pathophysiology of ischemic heart disease. And then the preoperative preparation and evaluation followed by actual intraoperative management and complications. So to begin the session, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay, Dr. Murugeshan, Dr. Harish, and myself will be uh, sort of uh, moderated from panelists. And I request Dr. Sanjay Banakal uh, to introduce the topic and uh, introduce the first speaker and uh, go forward from that point onwards. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome again, once again. And Dr. Sanjay Banakal is a senior consultant uh, in anesthesiology at the Muslim Shah Medical Center, which is a part of Narayana Health City in uh, Bangalore, Bomasandra. And I welcome uh, Dr. Sanjay Banakal to take over and conduct the meeting. Dr. Sanjay, please unmute Thank you, yourself. Dr. Murli, unmute the... yourself and put on your video and then carry on. Thank you, Dr. Murlida. Uh, uh, I'm grateful for being invited to this uh, webinar of, conducted by the Indian College of Anesthesia. So we have an uh, excellent session on uh, the TRP in an ischemic heart disease. Uh, the first speaker would be Dr. Rakesh R. He is a consultant uh, anesthesiologist at Mazumdar Shah Medical Center, Narayana Hridayalaya, Bangalore. He will be speaking on this topic, approach to non-cardiac surgery in a patient with ischemic heart disease. It's over to you, Dr. Rakesh. Good evening, everybody. Today, I shall be speaking about the approach to cardiac patients for non-cardiac procedure. I shall be covering the topic under this heading, introduction, surgical risk, risk scoring, algorithm for the management and modifications, perioperative monitoring and diagnosis, and risk factors for the complications. Introduction. The life expectancy of general Indian population has increased and there is also an increase in the incidence of coronary artery disease among the population. The number of people with coronary artery disease with or without intervention coming for non-cardiac procedure has also increased. We need a framework for considering the cardiac risk of non-cardiac surgery in a variety of patients and surgical situations. We need to be able to evaluate the patient's current medical status and make recommendations concerning the evaluation, management, and risk of cardiac problems over the entire perioperative period. We need to be able to provide a clinical risk profile that the patient, primary physician, anesthesiologist, and the surgeons can use to in making decisions that may influence short and long-term cardiac outcomes. The goal of the consultation is to identify the most appropriate testing and treatment strategies to optimize the care of the patient provide an assessment of both short and long-term cardiac risk, and avoid unnecessary testing in this era of cost containment. Preoperative intervention is rarely necessary simply to lower the risk of surgery unless such intervention is indicated irrespective of preoperative context. Coming to the surgical risk, uh, the surgical risk is divided into three groups, the low surgical risk, the intermediate surgical risk, and the high surgical risk. In the low surgical risk, there are mostly the superficial and minor procedures. In the intermediate surgical risk, the surgeries that are included are carotid endarterectomy, endovascular aneurysm repair, head and neck surgery, intraperitoneal procedures like splenectomy, hiatus hernia repair, cholecystectomy. 
intrathoracic procedures which are non major uh, major neurological orthopedic procedures like hip and spine surgeries peripheral arterial angioplasty renal transplant neuro neurological or gynecological major procedure the high risk surgeries include adrenal resection aortic and major vascular surgery carotid symptomatic procedures duodenal pancreatic surgery liver resection bile duct surgery esophagectomy open lower limb revascularization for acute limb ischemia or amputation pneumonectomy whether vats or open procedure pulmonary or liver transplant repair of perforated bowel total cystectomy coming to risk scoring there are various uh, risk scoring and calculators available presently the most commonly used and the oldest one that we use is the revised cardiac risk index this has six points and each point each factor is given one point uh, the points are uh, ischemic heart disease cerebrovascular disease uh, history of congestive heart failure uh, insulin therapy for uh, diabetes serum creatinine level more than 2 mg per deciliter high risk surgeries each of these points is given one point and depending on the number of points the risk is attributed to the other uh, risk calculators are surgical risk calculator american college of society national surgical quality improvement program that is acs sqip uh, surgical outcome risk tool american university of beirut uh, surgical risk index so now in the revised cardiac risk index in case the patient has one factor positive in him a patient has around 6% of major adverse cardiac event in case there are two factors which are positive then it is 10.1% of major adverse cardiac events and in case there are greater than or equal to 3 points the risk is 15% of major adverse cardiac event the other risk scorings uh, they calculate they have online calculators and the link is given below once the data is entered the risk profile for that particular patient is given in 2007 Gupta and colleagues used uh, data collected from the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program to create a risk prediction model using data from 525 US hospitals to predict the risk of myocardial infarction and cardiac arrest. So it is called the NSQIP MIC. MIC stands for myocardial infarction and cardiac arrest. This model uses the type of surgery, functional status, creatinine concentration, American Society of Anesthesiologists physical status classification and age as a predictor. this model was found to have better discrimination over the rcr uh, this uh, mica scoring it improves on prior perioperative major cardiac event risk calculators for surgical patients by using data sets built on modern standards of care in cardiac event assessment and in, addi in addition to stratifying risk based on type of plan procedure the criteria for myocardial ischemia was new troponin elevation greater than 3 times the upper limit the drawback is it tends to underestimate cardiac events in patients with elevated risk so those patients who have three or more risk factors the percentage given in this is underestimated it is useful in patients undergoing low risk procedure or who are anticipated to require less than 2 days of admission coming to the american college of surgeons national surgical quality improvement programs surgical risk calculator it was created in 2013 to provide procedure specific risk It's an online calculator that uses 21 patient-specific variables and calculates the risk of developing myocardial infarction and ca or cardiac arrest, apart from other complications. The goal of the risk calculator is to provide accurate patient-specific risk information to guide both surgical and decision surgical decision making and inform consent. The present online calculator uses machine learning and not the older regression methods to give more accurate results. This machine learning methodology has been started from 2022. these are the factors taken into consideration in the risk scoring the type of procedure in the first column and uh, the rest of the uh, factors are uh, selected from a drop down menu they are age sex functional status emergency case asa class steroid use for chronic condition ascites within 30 days prior to procedure systemic sepsis within 48 hours whether the patient is ventilator dependent and the patient has disseminated cancer whether the patient is diabetic patient is hypertensive requiring medication congestive heart failure in the last 30 days dyspnea current smoker within one year history of severe copd dialysis acute renal failure and body mass index calculation now coming to the algorithm for management this is the main focus of the approach of patient for, for non cardiac procedure 
once it's decided that the patient is requires a non cardiac surgery we need to see whether it's an emergency surgery or an elective surgery if it's an emergency surgery then the patient is taken for the procedure with uh, perioperative risk stratification and risk factor management in case the surgery is not emergency whether it's elective or an urgent procedure we need to assess whether the patient has had a coronary revascularization within the last 5 years if he has undergone a coronary revascularization whether any new symptoms have occurred or if there are no new symptoms the patient can be taken to the operating room if there are new symptoms then we have to see whether patient has undergone recent coronary evaluation if a recent coronary evaluation is un- patient has undergone then whether we have to see whether uh, angiogram or stress test was done and if it is done and patient has favorable result and no change in symptoms patient can be taken up for procedure if the result has unfavorable result or patient has developed new symptoms or recent coronary evaluation is not done then we need to assess the clinical predictors whether there is a major clinical predictors intermediate clinical predictors or minor clinical predictors. if there are major clinical predictors like unstable coronary syndromes decompensated congestive heart failure significant arrhythmias or severe valvular disease then we need to consider or cancel the non cardiac surgery medical management and risk factor modification needs to be done and subsequent care dictated by findings and treatment result but if we need to under uh, estimate the patient's risk we need to undergo patient will need to undergo coronary angiography and then subsequent care dictated by the findings and treatment in case the patient has intermediate clinical predictors then we need to assess whether the patient has uh, poor meds or moderate to excellent meds if it's a low risk procedure patient can be taken up for the procedure if it is poor meds then we have to assess the patient further by doing non invasive testing like echocardiogram if the testing shows low risk then the patient can be taken for operating if it is high risk then we need to consider coronary angiography and subsequent care dictated by findings and treatment results in case the patient has good meds if the procedure is intermediate risk then we can go ahead with the procedure if it's a high risk procedure then the patient will need to undergo the non invasive testing like 2d echocardiogram and then go ahead similarly if the patient has minor or no clinical predictors then again when we have to assess the metabolic equivalence of the patient if it is moderate or excellent then the patient can be taken up for the operating room if the patient has poor meds then we need to see what type of surgery is planned whether it's high high risk surgical procedure or intermediate intermediate risk still the patient can be taken up for the operating room if it is high risk uh, procedure then we'll need to do non invasive testing with video echocardiogram and then again if it is low risk go to the operating room if it is high risk we'll need to consider doing coronary angiogram and subsequent treatment this algorithm when after it was made then we found some further reasons that we needed uh, to modification the re- these reasons are the uh, rampant cardiovascular disease cardiovascular disease is responsible for 31% of all deaths globally a uh, bedside echocardiographic examination using handheld device can provide great incremental value in emergent situations that may allow measures to optimize perioperative outcome and to obtain baseline information also for medical legal reasons so the orange boxes that are there here in this algorithm are the suggested uh, modification so in step 1 we can consider bedside uh, investigations even if it's an emergent procedure but in step 1 and 2 we need to review the ecg x-ray echocardiography and also obtain the patient's drug history and then between step 5 and 6 we need to assess whether if meds is less than 4 we need to consider doing uh, brain natriuretic peptide and troponin levels and uh, even before doing pharmacological stress testing ct coronary angiogram uh, can be planned so the proposed modifications as i said were inclusion of bedside ecg chest x ray and echocardiography before emergent non cardiac surgery in patient known to suffer from cardiac death. between step 1 and 2 a review of ecg chest x ray echocardiography and drug history to be included in the algorithm in the patient known to suffer from cardiac disease between step 5 and 6 when metabolic equivalence is less than 4 or meds are unknown the inclusion of brain natriuretic peptide and troponin for assessment of severity of cardiac disease process and in step 7 consider a ct angiography coronary angiography as an alternative 
to or before pharmacological stress testing or invasive coronary angiogram. Coming to perioperative monitoring and diagnosis. Uh, perioperative monitoring, uh, we need to do a baseline ECG and a troponin. And after the procedure, at 24 hours and 48 hours, we need to repeat the troponin. If the troponin levels are normal, then patient is all right. In case the troponin levels goes more than the upper normal limit, then it's a pericardial myocardial infarction. We'll need to identify the cause of the pericardial myocardial infarction uh, to, with clinical assessment, ECG, and echo. Once the echo is done, then we can find out what is the cause. The most common causes are either cardiac or non-cardiac. In the non-cardiac, it is usually the severe sepsis, pulmonary embolism, or stroke. In cardiac cause, there is type 1 MI, which is due to plaque rupture and thrombosis causing occlusion of the vessel. In type 2, it is basically a supply demand mismatch. It could be either due to uh, hypotension, anemia, or tachyarrhythmias. The other uh, cardiac causes for rise in uh, troponin is acute heart failure and uh, likely type 2 MI, which could be due to missed type 1 MI, undocumented hypotension, or mild hypotension. Next, coming to the risk factors for complications. There are patient-related factors, procedure-related factors, and other post-operative factors. In patient-related factors, there are chronic and acute or subacute. The chronic is what we evaluated using the risk indexes, what we discussed earlier. Subacute will be in the algorithm that we assess, the acute coronary syndrome, diabetic syndrome, stroke, trauma. Uh, then the next procedure-related factors, urgency of the procedure, hypertension, hypercoagulability, uh, bleeding and inflammation, tachycardia, hypothermia, and systemic nervous system stimulation. Postoperative factors will be hypertension, bleeding, hypoxemia, tachycardia, and pain. Once we know what are the factors, we can look for, assess, and optimize these factors to get better outcomes. In case any of these factors are positive or it occurs despite our measures, the complications that can occur are type 1 myocardial infarction, type 2 myocardial infarction, heart failure, Arthmias, pulmonary embolism, stroke, and cardiovascular death. These are what we were discussing as the major adverse cardiac events. Thank you. These are my references. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh, for a nice talk on uh, this subject, uh, patient uh, approach to the patient who is got ischemic heart disease coming for non-cardiac surgery. So we'll move on to the next topic, and I invite Dr. Murugeshan to moderate the next session. Thank you, sir. Um, now I invite the, our next speaker, uh, Dr. John V. She is a junior consultant in the Department of uh, Anesthesiology, Ajum Darsa Medical Center, Narayana Health City, Bangalore. She is going to talk about the pathophysiology of uh, ischemic heart disease. Over to Dr. John V. Good evening. Today, I'll be talking about the pathophysiology of ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease is the result of the imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand, where there are four syndromes or four components of it, which is angina, myocardial infarction, chronic ischemic heart disease with congestive cardiac failure, and sudden cardiac death. Coming to the coronary circulation, from the iota, we have the left main coronary artery and the right coronary artery. The left main coronary artery splits into the left anterior descending and the left circumflex artery. The right coronary artery supplies the sinoatrial node, the atrioventricular node, most of the right ventricle, and the posterior one-third of the septum. The left side of the circulation supplies the anterior two-thirds of the septum, the anterior and the lateral walls of the left ventricle. Here, it is important to note that the majority of the myocardial uh, cells are supplied by the left, uh, left sided -right circulation and most of the conduction system is supplied by the right side of the circulation. Coming to the cardiac cycle, the systole lasts for about one third of the cardiac cycle, which is about 0.3 seconds, and the diastole lasts for about two third of the cardiac cycle, which is about 0.5 seconds. It is important to note that the uh, lengthier portion of the diastole uh, contributes to the coronary blood flow and the left ventricular filling occurs during the diastole. So any clinical condition which increases the heart rate that reduces the time for filling, uh, reduces the left ventricular ejection fraction, and it also reduces the coronary blood flow. 
there are certain factors that determine the cardiac output. The cardiac output is the uh, heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. The stroke volume in turn is again determined by the preload, afterload, and the contractility. The stroke volume, uh, the absolute value comes to about 70 to 80 ml in an adult, which is left ventricular and diastolic volume, subtracted by the left ventricular and systolic volume. Preload is the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of the diastole uh, in a regular cardiac cycle. Uh, as we can see from the graph, an increase in the preload increases in the cardiac output by means of increasing the stroke volume. There are certain determinants of the preload. First is the blood volume, the posture of the patient, the intrathoracic pressure, the pericardial pressure, the venous tone of the patient, the heart rate, and the rhythm. Frank Starling law is important here. It states that the initial length of the muscle fiber, here we will be talking about the cardiomyocytes, the length is directly proportional to the force of contractility of the said muscle fibers. This is only within the physiological limits, and that is what we see in the graph here. Coming to the afterload, the afterload is the resistance or the pressure against which the left ventricle has to pump. This roughly correlates with the aortic systolic pressure. Contractility is the ability of the myocardium to pump the blood into the systemic circulation. There are certain determinants of the afterload, which has the vascular tone, the blood pressure, the stiffness of the aorta, and the aortic valvular regurgitation. Here in the graph, we can see any increase in the afterload reduces the stroke volume, hence reduces the cardiac output. The determinants of contractility, again, sarcomere length based on the frank Starling law and the inotropic state of the heart. Coming to the coronary blood flow, coronary blood flow is about 60 to 80 ml per minute per 100 grams of tissue of the heart. The peak coronary blood flow is seen in early diastole, and there is a reduced um, coronary blood flow in the later part of the diastole. The important part of this is the arterial oxygen extraction in the coronary blood flow is about 70 to 80%, as opposed to about 20 to 25% in the rest of the body. Coronary perfusion pressure is the aortic diastolic pressure subtracted by the left ventricular diastolic pressure. It is usually about 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury, and this is a major determinant of the coronary blood flow. Then coming to the coronary autoregulation, it maintains a relatively constant flow at a mean arterial pressure of about 60 to 140 millimeters of mercury. Anything beyond this limit of 60 and 140 becomes a pressure dependent flow. The other uh, components that affect the coronary blood flow are the heart rate, the wall tension, the contractility, neural control, which is mainly sympathetic and to a lesser aspect parasympathetic and humoral control. Coming to the myocardial oxygen supply versus demand, this is a very important concept. Uh, whenever there is a decreased myocardial oxygen supply or an increased myocardial oxygen demand, we notice that the patient develops an ischemic event. So there are, this, there are certain clinical states that reduce the uh, supply, which is anemia, hypoxia, acidosis, hypotension, heart failure, aortic stenosis, or um, vasopressor use. Apart from this, an increased oxygen demand is seen in certain clinical states, which is sepsis, inotropic use, fever, use of cocaine, methamphetamines, any infection, thyrotoxicosis, Again, um, aortic stenosis, hypertensive emergencies, and heart failure. In this, a decrease in the coronary perfusion pressure, decrease in the diastolic time, or decrease in the collateral circulation, in turn reduces the coronary blood flow, which in turn reduces the oxygen supply. And any increase in heart rate, any increase in contractility, or the wall tension increases the oxygen demand, which again, both of these result in ischemia. There are certain risk factors for IHD. Uh, these can be divided into modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable such as age, gender, and genetics of the patient, and modifiable such as obesity, smoking, stress, hypercholesterolemia, uncontrolled hypertension, or uncontrolled diabetes. Coming to the pathogenesis of IHD, Despite IHD being used synonymously with coronary artery disease, there are other pathophysiological processes that contribute to this entire spectrum of IHD. Coming to vasospasm, vasospasm can occur because of an organic stenosis, whether there is an increase in the basal vasomotor tone of the coronaries or a coronary hypercontractility. This usually happens because of uh, 
There's a row kinase pathway which increases myosin action. Uh, genetics and endothelial dysfunction, both of these are because of uh, abnormality in the nitric oxide synthesis, which reduces the amount of nitric oxide available in the endothelium and increases the vasospasm. Second is the coronary microvascular dysfunction. This uh, usually occurs in arteries which are relatively small, about 50 to 200 microns. It causes ischemia with non-obstructive CAD or myocardial infarction with non-obstructive CAD. This is important because it is strongly associated with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Coming to inflammation, uh, inflammation either causes the pathophysiological process of IHD or it um, increases the progression of the pathophysiological uh, process of IHD. So we see cytokines, we see oxidative stress because of reactive oxygen species, we see CRP, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, all these three are used as biomarkers for the IHD. There are certain mechanisms of ischemia based on the pathophysiological process. First is the atherosclerotic disease. In this, we see two kinds. Either there's a stable plug or there is a vulnerable plug. A stable plug causes a reduction in blood flow continuously, which causes ischemia or angina. A vulnerable plaque is when the plaque cap is not stable, so there may be a plaque rupture, which can cause bleeding, which can cause thrombosis, which can cause an acute coronary event. Coming to the vasospastic disease, it can either be a persistent situation or it can be a focal and transient situation. A persistent vasospasm causes myocardial infarction, whereas a transient vasospasm causes a prince metal or variant angina. Coming to microvascular dysfunction, it impairs blood flow in patients who are at risk for the dysfunction and it causes a very severe acute ischemia. The progression of ischemia, as we see here, in the first four hours, pathologically, we don't see uh, significant uh, changes. Later, after that, we see um, there's an early coagulative necrosis and there is inflammatory cells that are entering the area. Then we see that there is inflammation that surrounds the area of coagulative necrosis. The coagulative necrosis becomes more severe and uh, there is neutrophil infiltrate. The neutrophil infiltrate progresses to macrophage infiltrate. Then there is granulation tissue that is formed at the margins. Slowly over a period of two weeks to few months later, there is a contracted scar that is complete. Atherosclerosis being the most important uh, uh, pathophysiological event here. It usually starts, the process of atherosclerosis starts in the first decade of life itself. So we have a healthy artery, then there is an initial lesion, which is basically when there is inflammation, there is some endothelial dysfunction and monocytes are recruited into the area, which develops into a fatty streak. Fatty streak is nothing but some foam cells, some inflammation and cholesterol crystals getting accumulated. Next, we have an intermediate lesion where we do have some foam cells, we do have um, lipid accumulation, and we do see some vascular smooth muscle migration here, which develops into an atheroma. Atheroma is when there is foam cells, there is a proliferation of the vascular smooth muscle cells with a lipid core and a cap. This cap, when it becomes fibrous, uh, fibrous calcific, and with multiple layers, we call it a fibroatheroma. This fibroatheroma can develop into a complicated lesion, which is prone to rupture. So when it ruptures, we see the activation of coagulation cascade because there's thrombus formation, and that leads to an acute coronary syndrome. This is just a pictorial representation of the vulnerable plaque, stable plaque, and how it looks when the plaque is ruptured. Coming to angina, we have... Uh, there's a cardiovascular society of grading of angina. Grade one is no angina at ordinary physical activity. Grade two, there is a slight limitation of physical activity. Grade three is there's a marked limitation of ordinary physical activity. And grade four is the symptoms may be present at rest. There are four types of angina that we need to know. First is stable angina, which is also called a typical angina, which means patient has chest discomfort, which is usually precipitated by exertion. And it is relieved by rest or with nitroglycerins or other medications. It usually doesn't last for a very long time, maybe about five minutes. Coming to unstable angina, it's also sometimes called as a crescendo angina. It is a medical emergency because it is unpredictable. It may occur at rest and the pain does not subside with rest. 
Then variant angina or Prince metal angina, this does not occur in a patient with coronary artery disease per se because this occurs due to severe vasospasm of the coronary arteries. The patients present with severe chest pain, uh, sometimes it occurs at night or when the patient is sleeping and at rest. Coming to microvascular angina, it is also sometimes called cardiac syndrome X because it is um, it presents with a typical or atypical chest pain. There is no evidence of significant coronary vascular abnormality when an angiogram is done. Coming to perioperative myocardial infarction, the fourth universal definition of MI has five types. Type 1 and type 2 are relatively seen in the perioperative period, which I will be discussing. Type 3 uh, is usually sudden unexplained cardiac death with a background of myocardial ischemia. Type 4 is associated with per, uh, percutaneous coronary intervention or an instant thrombosis. Type 5 is associated with cardiac surgery. This is the universal definition of myocardial injury or infarction. For um, the term myocardial injury to be used, there has to be evidence of elevated cardiac troponins with at least one of the values being above the 99th percentile of the upper reference limit. The same for myocardial infarction. The criteria is the patient should have symptoms of myocardial ischemia. There should be new ischemic ECG changes. There should be development of some pathological Q waves and there should be imaging evidence of new loss of viable myocardium or new regional wall motion abnormality. And there could be an identification of coronary thrombus by angiography or autopsy. This is type one myocardial infarction. It's also called acute coronary syndrome. It is when there is a plaque with pre-existing plaque which has eroded and it has caused a thrombus. This thrombus can either be a occlusive thrombus or a non-occlusive thrombus, which means it can completely occlude the coronary artery or it can partially occlude the coronary artery. Either ways, both these situations lead to acute coronary syndrome. Type 2 myocardial infarction is a situation that occurs because of gross difference between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. So it occurs in a situation where the myocardial oxygen supply is significantly decreased or a myocardial oxygen demand is significantly increased. Uh, of note here is to remember that this type 2 myocardial infarction can occur in patients with no previous history or symptomatology of IHD. For example, if the patient has severe bleeding with uh, severe hypotension, a very low mean arterial pressure, and a very high heart rate, these patients can uh, theoretically present with myocardial infarction because of a supply-demand mismatch. There are certain terminologies that uh, we need to remember here. First is a stunned myocardium and a hibernating myocardium. Stunned myocardium is an acute situation. It's a transient ischemia that is usually completely reversible without any biochemical or metabolic deterioration once the perfusion, reperfusion has occurred. Hibernating myocardium is a more chronic condition where there's a contractile dysfunction due to ischemia with reduced blood flow, which occurs even at rest. This is a slide showing ischemia and reperfusion. So we all, all already know the issues with ischemia happening. During reperfusion, even though there is a, loss, a wash of, washout of lactic acid, there is a restoration of physiological pH, but there are also reactive oxygen species and other cytokines that are released. Apart from that, the sarcoplasmic reticulum also releases calcium. All of these together cause myofibril contracture and reperfusion injury. Coming to the mechanical complications of myocardial infarction, they can be classified into early and late mechanical complications. The early complications, if the ventricular septum itself is ruptured, the patient goes into cardiogenic shock. If there is a damage to the papillary muscles, it can cause valvular regurgitations. If the free wall of the myocardium is ruptured, it can cause cardiac tamponade. In the later part, the late mechanical complications, because of scarring or if it's a contained or uncontained rupture, we see an L LB aneurysm. It can be a true aneurysm. It can also be a pseudo aneurysm. Again, the complications of myocardial infarction. Easier way to remember is because of Darth Vader, the mnemonic, death, arrhythmias, rupture, tamponade, heart failure, valvular injury, aneurysm of the ventricle, Dressler syndrome, embolism, and recurrence or regurgitation. 
this is just a sequence of events of what I've spoken till now, the pathophysiological process, the etiology, the reperfusion injury, everything together in a single flow chart. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Janvi, for giving this uh, very informative and elaborative talk on the various pathophysiological process of uh, ischemic heart disease. Thank you. So now I call the next uh, our introducer, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Harris, our senior consultant, the Department of Anesthesiology, Majumdarsa Medical Center, Narayanagal City, Bangalore, to introduce the next speaker to continue this program. Thank you, Dr. Murgesan. Uh, next, uh, I'll call upon uh, Dr. Achala uh, to talk on uh, preoperative evaluation. Uh, welcome, Achala. You can uh, start now. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here to present on the topic preoperative evaluation and monitoring in a patient with IHD coming for TUR. The goals of preoperative evaluation are to evaluate the patient's current medical status, clinical risk profiling of the patient, to take decisions for further testing, treating modifiable risk factors, and to plan the management for perioperative period. How we go about it is by doing a thorough history and physical examination, preoperative investigations and preoperative cardiac testing, risk stratifying the patient, reviewing the pharmacotherapy uh, that is going on and modifications of the same and taking decisions on bridging therapy. Coming to the history, we have to first see if the patient has a previous history of IHD. In case of a patient who has a known IHD, we have to ask for chest discomfort, exertional dyspnea, which represents an anginal equivalent. You have to ask for any recent worsening of previous symptoms and features of heart failure like orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and fetal edema. We also have to evaluate the patient's exercise tolerance, go through the concurrent comorbidities like diabetes mellitus, hypertension, CVA, obesity, renal disease, take history of previous surgeries or anesthesia and the hospital course of the same, take a detailed drug history and drug allergies, and a thorough airway assessment. We have to uh, do a functional assessment of the patient using the Duke Activity Status Index. So this is a 12-point score. Uh, we have to ask the patient about all the physical activities that they are able to do. And each of these has a weightage. So uh, we have to score the patient based on all the things they are able to do. If the score is more than 34, this indicates a reduced 30-day mortality after a non-cardiac surgery. The higher the score, the better is the functional capacity. Most of these patients are of geriatric age group. So in a patient who is more than 70 years of age, the uh, European uh, Society for Cardiovascular Surgery recommends that we have to do a frailty index screening uh, based on the validated screening tool. So what screening tool we use are the frail phenotype. So this is a five-pointer score which divides the patients into robust, pre-fail, frail, and frail patients. And there's another uh, entity called the clinical frailty scale. This is a subjective score. And any patient that uh, comes after four is said to be frail. So the most commonly used is something called the modified frailty index or the MFI. This was 11 factor frailty index because it is cumbersome to do a 11 factor frailty index. It was reduced to a five factor index which consists of functional dependency, history of diabetes mellitus, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, and hypertension. So anything beyond two indicates frailty. In frail patients, the post-operative morbidity can be reduced by doing something called the prehabilitation. What prehabilitation consists of is nutrition, exercise, incentive spirometry, and psychological support. And all these have to be started four weeks prior to the procedure. Coming to the physical examination, we mainly focus on uh, history, uh, signs and symptoms of uh, congestive heart failure. And anemia is an independent risk factor for major adverse cardiac events. So pallor has to be particularly 
noted. So risk stratification, there are various cardiac indices uh, through which we can risk stratify the patient as was covered by Dr. Ra uh, Rakesh in the previous talk. So coming to the preoperative investigations, we asked for the complete blood count, renal function test, liver function test, RBS, blood grouping typing, coagulation profile, biomarkers when indicated, and chest X-ray. So cardiac testing and supplemental cardiac testing, there are various modalities. This is the American Heart Association recommendation for preoperative evaluation and cardiac testing. So a 12 lead uh, resting ECG will be done in all patients who have coronary artery disease undergoing an intermediate and high risk surgery. So ECG has to be done in such patients. Also, if the patient is less than 65 years of age, independent of the age of the patient, if the patient gives a history of family history of cardiomyopathy and ECG, also a transthoracic echocardiography has to be done. And in a patient who is more than 65 years of age, uh, who is known to have a cardiovascular disease with risk factors or symptoms that are suggestive of cardiovascular disease, a 12 lead ECG and also biomarker has to be measured. That is the high sensitive cardiac troponin T or I before the surgery and also 24 and 48 hours after the surgery. In a patient who has newly detected murmur, chest pain, dyspnea, and peripheral edema, it is recommended that a transthoracic echocardiography be done. Uh, if there's a new murmur without any other symptoms, if such a patient is undergoing an intermediate or high risk procedure, then a transthoracic echocardiography has to be done. So the recommendations for stress testing and coronary angiography, uh, coronary angiography, the same, uh, it is recommended to be used in the same indications for uh, revascularization and preoperatively as in a non-surgical setting that will be taken care of by the cardiologist. And for stress imaging, stress imaging is recommended in those patients who have a poor functional capacity and have a very high likelihood of coronary artery disease or a high clinical risk. So preoperative optimization of these patients has, is a three-limbed approach consisting of risk reduction strategies, pharmacotherapy, and bridging therapy. The risk reduction strategies, general risk reduction recommended is to stop smoking for four weeks prior to the procedure and to get control of the cardiovascular risk factors like dyslipidemia, blood pressure, and diabetes mellitus. So there are certain drugs that have to be continued throughout the perioperative period. This is a class one recommendation that is beta blockers and statins. If the patient is already on these two drugs, it has to be continued throughout the perioperative period. And in stable patients with a stable heart failure, perioperative continuation of uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors may be considered. So what drugs have to be held prior to the procedure is AC and ARB, uh, AC inhibitors and ARBs. Uh, if the patient is on diuretic, that is to treat the hypertension, then we can consider discontinuation of these diuretics on the day of the surgery. And if the patient is on SGLT2 inhibitors like empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, these have to be stopped three days prior to the procedure because it has a risk of euglycemic ketoacidosis. And uh, the recommendations say that routine. Uh, starting initiation of beta blocker perioperatively is not recommended. So which antiplatelets, uh, how we have to stop the antiplatelets in a patient who comes to us post PCI, if the ACS uh, at index of PCI was, uh, the index of PCI was ACS or there are other uh, high risk uh, factors, then we have to Withhold, we should not do the surgery up to at least three months of the index event, that is the PCI. And in case it is a time-sensitive surgery, then we can consider withholding the antiplatelets from three months onwards. And in an elective case, we have to postpone till 12 months after the PCI. So how we stop the antiplatelet therapy based on uh, the thrombotic risk of the patient 
as in PCI less than one month, ACS less than three months, or high risk of stent thrombosis, like patients who have a recurrent MI, patients who have had a stent thrombosis even on antiplatelets, or a patient who has low EF of less than 40%. We can interrupt these uh, ant, uh, antiplatelets, ticagrelor from three to five days prior to the surgery, clopidogrel five days prior to the surgery, and prasugrel seven days prior to the surgery. And we have to continue aspirin throughout the procedure. In case there is a high thrombotic risk, then we have to consider bridging these antiplatelets using glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors or cangrelor. So how we do the bridging? Once we stop the clopidogrel or ticagrelor five days prior to the procedure, after two days of stoppage, we can start the patient on an infusion of tirofiban or ectifibatide up to four to six hours prior to the procedure and then stop the infusion, which can be restarted after four to six hours after the procedure. And in case we are using Cangrelor, it has to be, uh, it can be started even earlier, but has to be started two days after withholding clopilate and can be continued up to one to six hours prior to the procedure, restarted after four to six hours. Coming to the monitoring, Standard ASA monitoring and invasive monitoring are the two modalities. So standard monitoring has to be done, ECG, multi-lead ECG. Uh, so three leads, lead two, V4 and V5 combined have a 98% sensitivity to pick up the myocardial infarction or ischemia. Tachycardia uh, has to be controlled. Hypo, because of hypothermia, we have to do a proper temperature monitoring as these patients are geriatric, they are frail, also, irrigation fluid also uh, reduces their body temperature. Signs of pulmonary edema and hyponatremia and cerebral edema have to be looked for during the procedure. Invasive hemodynamic monitoring is done using an arterial uh, cannula. So, mean arterial pressure has to be maintained 60 to 70 mm of Hg. If it reduces less than this, then there's an increased risk of morbidity. So pulse pressure variability is a dynamic indication of preload reserve. If it is more than 13%, that we should give the patient some volume expansion. There are three other modalities that are important in invasive, uh, uh, invasive monitoring. So SVV, this represents the cyclic respiratory changes on the venous return. Anytime uh, the SVV is more than 15%, we have to give a volume expansion. Also, there's dynamic arterial elastins. If this is more than one, vasopressors can be weaned off. And hypotension prediction index, it is an algorithm that computes data and gives a number in between 0 to 100. If the uh, number is more than 85, treatment is indicated. This is, uh, this is a non-invasive cardiac output monitoring. Uh, this is based on the bioimpedance mechanism, and this also can be used. Uh, thank you, Achala, for uh, a detailed uh, explanation. And uh, uh, I would uh, uh, invite Dr. Murlizar to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much and a very nicely done seminar so far. And we are going to the next section of the presentations. The actual uh, bread and butter uh, Discussion on interoperative management of patients undergoing uh, TURP when they suffer already suffer from the skin heart disease. This will be dealt with by Dr. Naveen, who is a consultant in uh, anesthesiology at the Muslim Darsha Medical Center in Bangalore, which is a part of uh, um, Narana Health City Complex. Uh, over to Dr. Naveen. Naveen, please uh, uh, do, the, do your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, my topic for the day is uh, intraoperative management and postoperative complications in patients with IHD coming for the TERP surgery. Good evening, all. My topic for the day is intraoperative management and postoperative complications in patients with IHD coming for the TERP surgery. I'll be dealing the topic under these headlines. Introduction. Benign prosthetic hyperplasia is commonly seen in elderly male patients. Incidence is 50% in uh, males more than 60 years of age 
and nearly 85 to 90 percent in males more than 80 to 85 years of old age. Usually, the benign prostatic hyperplasia shares the common risk factors for coronary artery disease and IHD. Elderly patients will have multiple comorbid conditions. The surgical options for the uh, BPH depends upon the size of the gland and urinary symptoms. Transurethral resection of the prostate is the gold standard. Now, the recent advances include laser surgeries, OLEP, microwave, ultrasound, and heat ablation. And the disadvantage is in these options, we don't get uh, the tissue for biopsy, but they have added advantage of uh, reduced bleeding and uh, reduced incidence of uh, TERP syndrome. Open prostatectomy is considered in case of large gland, the glands weighing more than 100 to 150 grams. In patients who are very high risk for uh, uh, anesthesia, who are not fit for any kind of anesthesia, we, we can do urethral stunting under local blocks or you know perineal blocks. As per the study in 1996, uh, incidence of myocardial ischemia among the patients who were coming for TERP was around 18%. In 2013, it reduced to 7.9% thanks to all the advances in the medicine, better monitoring and uh, better un understanding of the pathophysiological factors. Anesthesia goals. Primary goal in IHD patients who are coming for TERP surgery is to avoid myocardial ischemia and to maintain myocardial blood supply and demand ratio. Choice of anesthesia. So we have to choose between spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia is definitely preferable over general anesthesia in case of uh, TERP surgery in cardiac as well as non cardiac patients. In uh, a review article in 2014, revealed that uh, 0 to 30 day mortality for patients who are uh, undergoing surgeries under regional central neuroaxial blockade is very less compared to general anesthesia in intermediate to high risk cardiac cases. 1995, the, this article was published in British Journal of Anesthesia. It says in the long term, there is no difference. Long term means after four to six weeks, there is no major difference between with the incidence of uh, acute myocardial ischemia uh, between general anesthesia and regional block. Spinal anesthesia is obviously preferred for all the good reasons. We can monitor the level of consciousness which helps to detect early signs of TERP syndrome, provides good post-operative analgesia, avoids polypharmacy, it reduces the risk of perioperative thromboembolic events, and mainly avoids stress response. There are many studies uh, which are conducted uh, to find out the optimum dose of uh, bupivacaine to, and also to minimize uh, incidence of hypotension and bradycardia. In 2012, this article was published, study was done at Turkey. They have used hyperbaric bupivacaine 0.5%, 4 mg and fentanyl 25 mg. This has produced a satisfactory anesthesia and these cases were done on a daycare basis. They could achieve highest sensory level of T10, which is useful. Uh, uh, to prevent any discomfort related to the bladder dysfunction with an average block duration of 120 minutes and average duration of stay in the ICU around 160 minutes. And in many case reports are there where you know TERP has been conducted under saddle anesthesia with a bupivacaine of uh, dose of 7.5 milligram to 10 milligram with uh, uh, less hypotension and better hemodynamic control. This study, this was an observational study which we have done in our institution where uh, we have observed the patients with low ejection fractions. Most of them are secondary to the IHD where a conventional dose of 0.5% bupivacaine and fentanyl was given. 
uh, for spinal anesthesia. We were coming for various surgeries apart from turf, including turf also. Where what, what we noticed is as long as the sensory block is up to T8, uh, we could you know, fairly control the hemodynamics. Uh, there are no significant incidence of uh, hypotension or bradycardia. General anesthesia. General anesthesia is considered when spinal anesthesia is contraindicated. Goal is to maintain hemodynamic stability with attenuation of response to intubation and surgical stimulus. We can consider etomidate for induction. Etomidate is the drug of choice. Graded propofol injection can also be considered. Better to avoid ketamine. Airway, endotracheal intubation or LMA can be considered. Important is to avoid stress response. We can maintain with volatile agents or TIVA with muscle relaxants. Adequate analgesia should be provided. And better to avoid diclofenac, NSAIDs, consider paracetamol and opioids and uh, intrathecal blocks. Few words about irrigation fluids. Ideal irrigation fluid should be non-toxic, should be non-conductor of electricity, translucent or transparent, should be minimally absorbed, isotonic, easy to excrete. Means there is no ideal irrigation fluid as of now. Most commonly used irrigation fluids are glycine 1.5%, normal saline 0.9%, mannitol and sorbitol. Incidence of TERP syndrome is highest with the use of glycine. Interoperative monitoring. ASA standard monitors uh, must be considered. Invasive arterial line based on the patient condition. If patient is sick with a low ejection fraction, we can consider arterial lines. We use flow track in our institutes. HPI, hypotension predictor index, is a good predictor of hypotension. But SVV and SVR are not reliable with since because of the vasodilatation secondary to the spinal anesthesia. Non-invasive cardiac output monitors are readily available now, uh, but we don't have them. And if available, it can be considered. Intraoperative complications include TERP syndrome, hemorrhage, myocardial ischemia, hypothermia, prostatic capsular perforation, bladder perforation, penile erection. TERP syndrome. TERP syndrome occurs secondary to absorption of fluid through open venous plexus in a resected posture. It can develop in the perioperative period. The incidence is 1 to 2%. Factors which affect the fluid absorption and, which, and increase the risk of TERP syndrome include duration of the surgery and resection more than one hour, inexperienced surgeons, height of the irrigation fluid above the patient should not be more than 40 centimeters and the pressure should not be more than 60 centimeters of water. Highly vascular gland, on an average, 10 to 30 ml of fluid gets absorbed per minute of resection time. And also the pre-existing hyponatremia and pulmonary edema, patients are more prone to develop TERP syndrome. Classical triad of TERP includes hypertension, bradycardia, and mental status changes, which are secondary to dilutional hyponatremia, fluid overload, and glycine toxicity. Symptoms and signs include altered mental status, irritability, disorientation, tachycardia followed by bradycardia, nausea and vomiting, hypertension secondary to the fluid overload, hypotension secondary to cardiac insufficiency, transient blindness in case of glycine toxicity and increased ammonia levels, angina can occur, dyspnea and hypoxia secondary to pulmonary edema and arrhythmias, convulsions with the low sodium levels, coma when sodium level is less, less than 100 millimoles per liter. Most of the symptoms depend upon the serum uh, level of the sodium. Investigation, investigations will reveal low serum sodium. ECG changes will appear once the sodium level is below 115 millimoles per liter. It includes widening of the QRS complex, ST elevation and T-wave induction. Hyperammonemia, ABG we can see high anion gap with the low serum osmolality. Management, uh, immediately we should stop the surgery and uh, one further resection of the 
BPH. Fluid restriction, fluid restriction alone to around 800 ml for 24 hours can increase uh, sodium levels by 1.5 milli equivalent per liter over 24 hours. In mild cases, we can consider uh, fluid restriction and uh, some other loop diuretics. Hypotonic saline, sodium chloride 3%. Is rarely used. It's considered when a patient is very disoriented with low sodium levels less than 120 millimole per liter. Correction should be at one one millimole per liter per hour, not to exceed uh, 20 millimole per liter or 48 hours or 1.5 millimole per liter per hour. A rapid correction of the sodium will lead to a condition called uh, central central pontine myelinosis. Can cause irreversible brain damage and death. Convulsions are treated with benzodiazepines, diazepam, and thiopentone. In case of coma and severe pulmonary edema, rapid management of patients with respect to airway, breathing, and circulation. Once patient is optimized, try to shift the patient to intensive care unit. Hemorrhage. Patient on an average can lose 2.4 to 4.6 ml of blood per every minute of resection. It is very difficult to quantify the bleeding because of the irrigation fluid. It gets mixed with the irrigation fluid. Factors associated with excessive bleeding are large gland more than 40 grams, prolonged surgery more than one hour, and coexisting infection. Urokinase released from a raw prostate may provoke systemic fibrinolysis. So consider tranexamic acid to reduce the bleeding. Myocardial ischemia. The incidence is around 8%. So we need to properly manage tachycardia and hypotension. In case of hypotension, vasopressors and inotropes to be considered. Adequate analgesia and temperature should be maintained. For analgesia, we can consider opiates and paracetamol. Perioperative beta blockers are definitely useful. Persistent ST elevation with hypertension, we can consider injection nitroglycerin. Monitor 12 ECGs, serial cardiac enzymes, 2D echo, and the post op preferably shift the patient to cardiac care unit. Hypothermia, we all know shivering causes tachycardia and increases myocardial oxygen requirement. Patients are elderly, we use large volumes of irrigation fluids plus vasodilatation during general anesthesia predispose these patients for severe hypothermia. Remember, prevention is always better than cure. Act fast. Take all the precautions to prevent hypothermia. Bladder perforation, one of the rare complications, can be extraperitoneal as well as intraperitoneal. Under spinal anesthesia, patient can present with shoulder tip pain Suprapubic, inguinal, or periumbilical pain when the sensory level is below P87. So it is very important not to give level higher level spinal anesthesia. Under general anesthesia, we can uh, see unexpected hypotension. And uh, I mean, after some time, we can see a abdominal distension. Also. Management includes immediate laparotomy and correction of the defect. Bacteremia and sepsis. Prostatic sepsis carries very high mortality. Always consider dose of aminoglycoside along with cephalosporins during induction. Postoperative monitoring and analgesia. The postoperative 12 lead ECG monitoring is must. Consider 2D echo and cardiac enzymes if there are ECG changes. For analgesia, we can consider paracetamols, opioids. Try to avoid NSAIDs as most of these patients are diabetic. And have chronic kidney dysfunction and uh, will be on dual antiplatelet therapy. So, better to avoid NSID. In case pain is very severe and unexplained, think about blood spasm and clot retention. Take, a, take home message patients with uh, IHD coming for TERP, most of them are elderly. They carry the same risk factors for 
BPH as well as the coronary artery disease like obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Most stressful surgical factor is fluid absorption. And spinal anesthesia is the most suitable technique. Block up to T10 will definitely provide excellent anesthesia. Turf syndrome, though, is rare, is a potentially fatal condition. Early recognition, prompt treatment is essential. Blood loss is difficult to quantify during this surgery. Thank you. Uh, that is a great talk, uh, Dr. Naveen. Uh, well done. Uh, you have covered most of the important points, especially regarding the incidence of BPH and choice of GA versus spinal or regional technique complications, etc. Thank you for that. And uh, I request all the panelists and the speakers to switch on their videos and then uh, take on the questions. If we go through the chat box, so there's one question on uh, what is the difference between type 1 and type 2 myocardial infarction? Um, either Jahnavi or uh, Rakesh can answer that. Uh, the type 1 myocardial infarction, it is yes. caused by an atherothrombotic event, which means there is a pre-existing plaque with an unstable uh, cap, which has ruptured. So that is uh, led, led to a cascade of thrombotic events, which has caused a thrombus. That can either completely occlude the said coronary artery, or it can partially occlude the said coronary artery. Either of these conditions will uh, result in symptomatology and an acute coronary syndrome. On the other hand, type 2 myocardial infarction is a situation where uh, there is a uh, either an uh, increased uh, demand for oxygen or a decreased supply of oxygen in the perioperative period. So this uh, severe mismatch in the blood supply, oxygen supply and demand is what causes the perioperative myocardial infarction. That is type two. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, basically in simplistic terms, uh, the Type 1 is a typical acute myocardial infarction which occurs as a result of hemodynamic stresses during the surgical procedure or anesthesia, which results as a, causes the rupture of the atherosclerotic plaque, which is already present. So this patient is already having the skin cartilage. There's a plaque which ruptures because of the hemodynamic uh, stress. This is leading to acute myocardial infarction. That's the type 1 MI. Type 2 MI is uh, a patient who may not be having coronary artery disease. Please note this. He may not be having coronary artery disease, but the heart rate has gone up and the blood pressure come down. There's distinct mismatch of the supply and demand. Suppose you have a heart rate of about 130 or 140 and the blood pressure about 60 or 70. If we do not uh, uh, correct it promptly, such a patient will develop a myocardial infarction, though he does not have a coronary artery disease. That is the fundamental difference between these two. Thank you for that reply. Uh, we'll go to the second question. Second question. Intraoperatively, what is common? Uh, either of them can occur, but in patients or otherwise normal, Type 2 can occur if there's gross hemodynamic instability because of bleeding or some other problem where there is a gross imbalance between the myocardial oxygen supply and demand. The question 3 is, uh, it's just question 3, I don't know why it's question 3. Anyway, patient on epidural catheter developed ACS and was stented. Very nice. And uh, he was started on antiplatelet double, dual antiplatelet therapy. When should we remove the catheter? Who will answer this question? Maybe Achala can start and we'll see. Anybody else can answer it. Achala, do you want to start the discussion on this? Antiplatelet therapy patient is already having a stent and there's an epidural catheter. When do you want to remove it? Very interesting question. 
Yes, that is a very specific question. Yes. So, <laughs> I would like to call upon uh, one of our senior consultants also to pitch in uh, for this. It's a, it's a really challenging question that was put. Yes. yes. So, yeah, we'll see, um, shall I uh, start with? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. See, whenever, uh, yeah, this can happen uh, when uh, any procedure is uh, performed under uh, epidural anesthesia. Uh, you know, when the patient develops acute coronary syndrome and when the patient is diagnosed with some kind of you know, ECG changes, uh, new development of regional wall muscle abnormality and uh, mm. you know, cardiac enzymes, elevation, all this, uh, you know, happens, then, you know, they will diagnose the ACS, then immediately need the PCI. So, during that time, uh, you know, when the epidural catheter is already is inserted, uh, one can consider to remove uh, the epidural catheter that time itself. You know, we, we need not, you know, continue that epidural catheter and we can uh, remove it and send the patient uh, where the, you know, cardiac care is being primarily given like a cardiac center. So they can uh, take the patient for the cardiac cath lab and uh, they perform the PCA and they can put on DAP and all that they can uh, do that one. So that's what uh, one has to do. And suppose if, uh, if somebody is some cardiologist without noticing the hanging of epidural catheter on the back of the patient and he, you know, um, does the uh, procedure, uh, coronary, coronary intervention and uh, uh, all this, uh, you know, antiplatelet medications and all that. Uh, yes, uh, you know, then uh, there will be always a risk of handling of epidural catheter for uh, removal and all that. That uh, risk has to be uh, explained to the patient, and uh, you know we'll have to remove um, when the patient is stable after the coronary in intervention. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Any responses from uh, Harish or Sanjay? Uh, normally, like we don't put uh, for those patients. Sir, like even if it is put, uh, like as Morgan said. No, uh, like we don't anyway we don't start uh, antiplatelets or uh, um, low molecular weight heparin or heparin at least for 24 hours uh, in our institute uh, before that we can remove uh, and uh, by mistake if at all uh, uh, they have started uh, we have to monitor after removing like uh, mm. you can keep it for uh, however the long you want but after that particular two, three days, uh, we have to monitor uh, after removing. You're right, you're right. Uh, Sanjay, do you want to say something on this? Sanjay, sir, is not there, sir. Okay, see, uh, actually, both of the responses are very good. Uh, but the situation is a peculiar in this. I think the what uh, the question is that the patient uh, had... Uh, patient uh, had uh, this circuit event during the procedure and the stent was put and the patient already had a epidural catheter. So how to remove that is the question. So the, the catheter was not removed before the percutaneous intervention. So this is a very peculiar situation. It should be, as uh, Harish told, you have to weigh the risks and benefits and with multidisciplinary collaborative um, discussions, the, the catheter can be removed in spite of the fact that patient is on dual antiplatelet agents, uh, taking care that uh, you have to strictly monitor the neurology uh, to avoid spinal hematoma. That's the greatest danger. You have to monitor the patient and uh, see that there is no hematoma developing which may compress the spinal cord and maybe having disastrous consequences. So you have to um, monitor the patient stringently and then pull the catheter out. Uh, the uh, this question of stopping the antiplatelet drugs for the sake of the removal of catheter can be considered, but it is uh, it has to be thoroughly discussed, as I said, with the multidisciplinary team, and then decision has to be taken. That's my response to that. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, sir, but just now we have received uh, one comment from the doctor who posted his query just a while ago. Uh, uh, kindly uh, kindly take a look in the chat box, please. 
Yes, yes, we are going to see that. We're going to, yes. We are going to see that. Thank you so much. We did wrote them very nice, very nice. That's very good. The one minute, let me read this word. We did wrote them and saw the platelet function. Excellent. You can actually, it's a very good idea. You can look at the platelet function. Now we, we have uh, the tag six, or you can even use what is called verify now, where we can exactly know what is the level of platelet inhibition. Maybe you can reduce the low dose of uh, antiplatelet agents to uh, a substantial level and then uh, take a call on pulling out the catheter, thus reducing the risk of spinal hematoma. Thank you very much. That's a good idea. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Just posted now. Uh, diabetes itself considers intermediate clinical predictor for diabetes. Predictor or diabetes on insulin therapy. This question will be going to Rakesh, who was talking about uh, RCRI, etc. So diabetes on insulin or only diabetes is enough to consider as a clinical predictor for in the RCRI. Yes, sir. So it's uh, diabetes with insulin therapy or diabetes having features of autonomic neuropathy. That will be considered as intermediate clinical risk factor. That's right. Actually, as per the recommendation, it only says diabetes on insulin. Insulin therapy. So According to the US study. On insulin, uh, uh, if it is well controlled, I don't think we should worry about it. Yes, yes. Ritu, any other question? There are no further questions. Uh, if there are no further questions, it's my humble duty to thank all the participants and the faculty present, Dr. Sanjay Banakal, Murugeshan, Harish, and the speakers, namely the Dr. Rakesh, Jahnavi, Achala, and Naveen for their excellent presentation. I was really happy with the presentation. Thank you so much. I think we are keeping up the uh, standard or ra rather increase in the standard of presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, we will meet you again next Wednesday for a similar webinar from the ICA. Thank you so much for joining. And it's my pleasant duty to thank you all. And as you may be aware, we also are doing the critical care echocardiogram fellowship. So uh, if anybody is interested, please contact us through ICA directly. Thank you very much. And I think Thank you, sir. time for Thank supper. You, sir. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear doctors, for sharing such valuable insights. Uh, so I hope you had a seamless experience. Now, with all your, all your due permission, we are signing off for today then and looking forward to host you again very soon. Thank you, sir. Good night to all.